go ahead and pray. It's 9.15, regardless of what the clock on the wall says. Thank you, Jesus, so much for this time. Lord, I just thank you for the way you love us. Lord, I, uh, I pray that today we just see your cross and what you've done for us in a whole new way. Lord, thank you for the examples you give us from thousands of years ago that still apply every minute to our lives today. And Jesus, I just pray, please drive the distractions outside the door. And just for this hour, please let us focus on you and what you have for each of us. Lord, I do pray that our ears are in tune to your frequency and that our eyes are looking at you and that our hearts are wide open. Even if we hear some things we need to work on, Lord, we know you'll help us with that. So thank you so much, Jesus, and you are just awesome. Thank you for what you did on the cross. Your precious name. Amen. All righty. March 2011, New York Times had a story about a 51-year-old ex-convict. His name was Robert Salzman. After a horrific childhood, he spent most of his adult life in prison. So when he was released from prison in 2001, he found it difficult to enjoy freedom outside of the prison walls. He struggled to pay rent and wound up in homeless shelters. Finally, in June of 2010, his life was transformed. While he was riding a New York City subway car, he met Rashad Ernesto Green. Actually, Rashad found him, in quotes. Green's a writer and director who at the time was looking for a man to play a tough-looking former convict in a film he was directing. Whose sovereign hand was under that one, right? After an addition, Green surprised nearly everyone when he gave Salzman a key role, key role in the film. In the following months, Salzman found it hard to believe he had gone from prison to stardom in a major motion picture. In fact, on one occasion, they were filming on location in a Long Island penitentiary, penitentiary when an exhausted Salzman fell asleep on a cot in a prison cell. When he woke up, he became confused and thought he was still a prisoner. He started to weep. Then it dawned on him that he was now a free man. He knew at any moment he could walk out of that cramped cell and through those prison doors and he was overwhelmed with joy. That's what happened to us. And it's so cool now. We get to go through Exodus, and we see Moses leading the people of Israel out of slavery, out of oppression, out of prison, to be honest. And that's what Jesus did for us on the cross. He, he led us away from that, away from the power of sin, away from the penalty of sin. We're still in the presence of sin until we go to heaven, but he broke its power over us. And, you know, if you look at it, it all started with a burning bush, remember? And Moses had to draw near to that burning bush. He turned aside to hear what God had to say to him. That's what the cross is calling out to us. And even if you've known Jesus as your Lord and Savior for decades, you still need to draw near to the cross sometimes and just sit there and wonder of, that's how much he loves you. That's what you were worth to him to give up his very life for you, that God gave up his son, the most precious one to him, to die for us on that cross. So just as Moses drew aside to that burning bush to see what God had to say to him, we need to draw near to the cross to just experience the full power of it, especially on those bad days, on the days that we're scared or anxious or feeling unworthy or if we've just messed up for the thousandth time. We draw to the foot of that cross and we see it all covered and his arms are open wide saying, hey girl, I did this for you and you're going to end up with me. I so wish we had those t-shirts, just the arrow pointing a different way and we'll be talking about that probably in the 70s, so that's, that's dating things. But remember the I'm with him, I'm with her t-shirts that had the arrows on them. For you young people, it's easy to understand you know, even if you didn't see them. But where we're going is we need I'm with him t-shirts okay, with the arrow pointing up. And so if we just remember that, and, and we'll be talking about it a lot, but God grabbed Moses' attention from that bush, but he had to be prepared to hear, okay? He'd been out in the, we talked about, the backside of the desert for 40 years. Remember, his, his life was broken up in the three 40-year segments, right? The first 40, he's in Egypt, growing up in the palace with Pharaoh after his parents had to turn him over. The next 40, from 40 to 80, he's in the desert, for, and, and I gave you the exact number of days, 14,600 mind-numbing days with the rocks and the sand and the sheep and the rocks and the sand and the sheep. You think, he didn't think God had given up on him? 40 years out there. His life for the Lord, you know, the, the Lord's call on him starts at 80 years old. 
So anybody that's sitting in here thinking you're too old, honey, you just started, okay? <laughs> if, if God has still got you here, living and breathing and even moving a little bit, there's a reason, okay? So we, we need to have this desire to listen. We need to prepare to listen. And, and you know, this convicted me too as I was starting to think about it. I tell you what, I don't, when I, when I teach, and I, I come across these things, I'm like, you know what, this, you need to do this every day. You, you, you came across this, so just when I share these things, I'm convicted first, and so as the conviction goes through me, then I'm excited to convict you, okay? But do you greet the Lord first thing every morning when you wake up? The first thing out of your mouth, good morning, Lord, thank you for another day. Thank you for giving me this. Thank you just for loving me, and then the, the thank you prayers just start rolling. Is that how your days start? Ask him what he has for you that day. Just, what are we going to do today? I'm with you. What are we going to do today? And if he answers, you know, if you feel, you know, you're going to stay home and have quiet time today. That's what needs to be okay, too. You know, so often we get in the rush of serving that we miss who we're serving. Okay, it's, it's wonderful to go and serve the Lord. But first and foremost has to be the love relationship. Because why are you doing it? Why are you doing it? You have to go to that core. I know sometimes I'm out serving and I find myself irritable. And I'm like, what is wrong with you? Okay? You've got to have first and foremost who you're doing it for. Okay? The love relationship has to come first. Are you just aware of his voice and his nudges, those nudges of the Holy Spirit? Are your ears tuned to his frequency? And we'll talk about how to get there today. And here's a big one. No selective hearing when God is speaking, okay? No selective hearing. Oh, my goodness, when God tells you to go visit somebody that you really like, absolutely, off I go. But when God sends you to go see Grumpy Gus, well, maybe tomorrow. I didn't hear you. Did you really want me to do that? Okay, no selective hearing when God is speaking. How do we get there? How do we get to be able to listen, to be tuned in, Honest to goodness, it's a simple thing to say. Harder to do because you have to set aside time. You need to make the time in your Bible your most important appointment of the day. John Wesley, he, you know, would fill out his planner every day. He didn't have the fancy ones we have. But every day he had an appointment with God. And he said, that is my most important appointment, my appointment with God. Because how are you going to hear him if your heart's not open to him? And, and like I've mentioned before, I just think it's so awesome because I'm a multitasker, okay? When you read your Bible, you're multitasking. You're worshiping as you read. You're going, look what you have done. Look how awesome you are. You're praying. You're praising. As God's word just goes and runs through your body, through your mind, through your soul, through your heart, and you're just lifting up, Lord, you are just the greatest, You're just doing all these things at once. You're reading, you're praying, you're worshiping. Make it your most important appointment of the day. you got to be ready when he calls you from the bush. And we're going to talk about what that looks like because you know what? I can give you three or four ways you're being called right now. Okay? We'll look at that. This is what I like Chuck Swindoll said this about Moses. He said, what was God's larger message to Moses in that moment? Release your imagination for a few moments. It might have included some thoughts such as these. Moses, 40 years ago, you were a fine-looking bush, impressed with all your own foliage. You had long, strong branches and lush green leaves, but when your bush started burning, it was gone in less than 48 hours. Your grand scheme went up in flames, charring your dreams and consuming your ambitions along with it. Think about that. All these great plans. How about the young girls that go to Hollywood or New York? with their grand scheme and their grand plans. And let me tell you what, no little girl sitting there playing ever said when somebody asked, what do you want to do? Yeah, I want to grow up and be a prostitute. I want to grow up and be used. Nobody ever said that. Charred dreams, consuming ambitions, consuming your dreams and your ambitions along with it. There was nothing left, was there? That was your life, Moses. That's the life of people that are being abused in our, our country now. That was your life. But then you ran like a scared rabbit across the border to get away from the Egyptian lynch mob. You thought you were a a choice, top quality bush before that happened. And now you don't think you're worth much at all. Listen, man, 
Any bush will do, as long as I, the great God of all grace, am in the bush. I want to use you, Moses. Stand still and let me set you on fire. That's what he said to Moses. That's what he says to people that were involved in sex trafficking and are being pulled out of that. Just let me consume you. Go burn for me. It's never too late. He wants to use every single one of us. Luis Palau, so many of us have heard about him. Let's, let's take Moses' burning bush to what Luis Palau had to, to learn about it, looking more contemporary. The great Latin American evangelist, Luis Palau, had to learn that lesson. During his first year at Bible school, Major Ian Thomas spoke at one of the chapel services. He talked about how it took Moses 40 years in the wilderness to learn that he was nothing. Then one day, Moses was confronted with a burning bush, like, likely a dry bunch of ugly sticks. Yet Moses had to take off his sandals. Why? Because God was in the bush. Major Thomas said, God was telling Moses, I don't need a pretty bush or an educated bush or an eloquent bush. Any old bush will do as long as I'm in the bush. If I'm going to use you, it won't be you doing something for me, but me doing something through you. Luis Palau said, I was that kind of bush, a useless bunch of dried up sticks. I could do nothing for God. All my reading and studying and modeling myself after others was worthless unless God was in the bush. Only he could make something happen. After that chapel service, Luis Palau ran back to his room in tears and cried out to God in his native Spanish. He'd been struggling with God's call his whole life, and finally the struggle was over. He said from that point on, he would let God be God, and Luis would be dependent on him. That's a more modern look at that. And you know what? Our burning bushes may look different. Okay, our burning bushes may look different. Going, well, God didn't call to me from a bush. And I was thinking about it. After class, say, Chrissy is out taking a walk, and she walks by a sagebrush, and it's burning, and it's not being consumed. And out of the bush comes the voice, Chrissy, go deliver California. Okay? <laughs> We're not going to make any political comments at this moment. But that's probably not what it's going to look like. Probably not what it's going to look like. What it's probably going to look like is Chrissy's out taking her walk, and she feels this little nudge, in quotes, and Chrissy, you're making a big um, pot of chili for your family tonight. Bring some to your neighbor, the widower. And just for further clarification, Chrissy, the one that you categorize as mean and grumpy, bring that dinner over there. So she does. She's obedient. She listens to the call. She listens to the nudge. And she goes over and she delivers dinner to this man who's by himself. Because you know what? She didn't have the big picture. She didn't know that that morning he slipped and he was all alone, nobody around to help him. And he was okay. He didn't have to go to the hospital or anything. But as he was sitting on the floor, he said, you know, if there is a God, I wish he'd just show me something. And here comes Chrissy with his dinner. She followed the call from the burning bush. That's what it looks like for us. And we'll talk about it too. When Chrissy does that, when you and I need to do that, we need to be intentional about telling people why we are doing that. Okay? Even if they don't say, why are you doing this? You say, you know, it's not because you're covered with awesome sauce and this is what you do. Okay? You're doing this because, you know what? I love Jesus and Jesus loves you. And I just want you to know that. We're intentional when we do things for people. So it's not just the nice lady down the street or the nice lady next door, whatever. You're intentional about why you're doing it. And if you're not comfortable with just spouting out the, the gospel message, I love Jesus, Jesus loves you, and he wants you to know that. We can all do that. Our burning bushes might look like that, those nudges that we obey. In fact, right now, what's God calling you to? Like I mentioned, we're living and breathing. What's God calling us to? Number one, he's calling you to draw near. Okay? He's calling you to draw near. It says in James 4, 8, draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. He is calling you right now to draw near to him, to ever deepen that love relationship. He just wants to be with you. He's not calling you to draw near to give you this laundry list of stuff to go do. He just wants you to be with him 
Draw near to God. And remember that silly, it's always been in my head, that visual, because it makes so much sense. You know, the old farmer driving the pickup truck and his wife sitting over as close to the passenger door as she can get. And she looks at him and she says, Honey, remember when I was so close to you while you were driving? I was almost on your lap. And he looks at her and says, Well, I ain't the one that's moved. Okay? (laughs) If you don't feel close to God, he ain't the one that's moved. Okay? It's you. It's you. And the beautiful thing is within moments you can be right back. I am so sorry for whatever sin it is that could be keeping you apart. I am so sorry for my inattention, my not listening to you, but I want to listen now. Will you help me? Why would God not answer a huge yes to that prayer? For all the people that are running around ignoring him and defying him, wait till we get to chapter 5 and we see the defiance and the scorn and the derision of Pharaoh the way Pharaoh acted, just at hearing God's name, you think one of us that doesn't go, Lord, would you just help me? I want to hear you better. I want to get closer to you. You think he won't help you with that? You must become just like a child. Talked about that little boy, Jordan, that got baptized. Jordan, why do you want to be baptized? I love Jesus. He's my favorite. Draw near to your favorite. Number two, so number one, what's God calling us to? Drawing near to him, he calls us to be his witnesses. That's in Acts 1.8, be my witnesses to the end of the earth. So Acts 1.8, go be my witnesses. Matthew 28.19, go make disciples. Go make disciples. So witnesses. 1 Peter 3.15, but in your heart set apart Christ as Lord and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is within you. Look at that. Two steps. Two steps. In your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. Just visualize a throne. A throne. Just the chair, a throne, right? On your heart. The next part, who's sitting on it? Who or what is on the throne of your heart? If it's anybody other than God, knock it off. Knock it off. I know usually the throne of my heart, if I'm going through something, it, it's me sitting there. Well, that's not going to turn out well, is it? We've got to get ourselves off the throne of our hearts. So the first part of Peter 3.15, but in your heart set apart Christ as Lord. And the second part, and always be ready to give a defense for the hope that's within you. That's being a witness. People are watching you. I loved it in in Mark chapter 4. You you know the story of when Jesus calmed the storm? Think about it for a second. Mark, Mark's a type A gospel writer. Okay, Mark just wants to get to the point. He gets Jesus faster to that cross than any of the other gospel writers. He's a type A. He uses the word immediately all the time. He doesn't use a whole lot of um, details, but he gave us a detail on that story of Jesus calming the storm. He talked about Jesus and the disciples getting in a boat to go to the other side, and he said, and other boats were watching. Why did he throw in that detail? They were watching to see what Jesus was going to do. Ladies, people are watching you. They're watching you. How does a Christian navigate our world of uncertainty right now? The hope that's within you. Always be ready to give a defense. How does a Christian go through what's going on now? Are they as fearful as everyone else? Are they as cynical as other people, as negative as other people? Or are we radiating Jesus Christ and love and joy and peace in the midst? People are watching you. Be a witness. Be a witness. Remember that silly little story about the the little fellow who was watching his pastor neighbor build a fence? This little eight-year-old boy sat there for two hours watching the pastor build a fence. They they were chatting back and forth, but finally the pastor said, Bud, it's a Saturday morning. Why aren't you playing ball with your friends or watching cartoons? What are you doing? And the little boy looked at him and said, Well, pastor, I've been waiting. I want to hear what a preacher man says when he hits his thumb with a hammer. Okay? (laughs) You're being watched. You're being watched. Okay, but what does that look like? I pray that if I asked anybody that knows you, what does it look like? Oh, she's different. Man, you know what? Yeah, she's going through all the same stuff everybody else is, but there's this, this joy in her. There's this peace in her. And then here's you. Always be ready to give a defense. 
for the hope that's within you because who's on the throne? Jesus Christ. It's just, it, it answers all the questions right there. What, in fact, is God calling you to? <laughs> Draw near, be witnesses, make disciples. Number three, be intentional. Like I talked about with the Chrissy example, when somebody asks why you're doing it, and even if they don't, be intentional. Doing this because I love Jesus, and he loves you, and he wants you to know that. Be intentional. 1 Peter 2.12, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Be intentional. That was 1 Peter 2.12. So look at all the things that God's calling to you from the bush right now. Finally, Micah 6.8. Micah 6.8. God, God gives us our marching orders. Do what's right. Tell me that doesn't apply to every aspect of your life. Just do what's right in God's eyes. He gives us a whole book telling us what's right. Do what's right. Number two, love kindness. Love kindness. And number three, walk humbly with your God. What more do we need than that? From the bush. Do the right thing. Love kindness. Walk humbly with me. That's what God's calling us to do. And then he'll give you more things as you stay attuned to him. And you'll find yourself just being blessed upon blessed as you are obediently blessing others. But, you know, Moses made mistakes. We saw he, he went before he was sent. Okay, remember Moses went before he was sent. He went out and killed an Egyptian because he, he knew he was supposed to deliver Israel in some way. But he went out in his own strength, and he leaned on his own understanding. I'm going to talk about that a lot today. So he went before he was sent. And then he ran after he failed. He ran after he failed because he wasn't doing God's will. He was doing what Moses thought was best. He was leaning on his own understanding. And then he resisted when he was called. Okay, so he, he went before he was sent. He ran after he failed. And he resisted after he was called. Three strikes. So God just flushed Moses and started with somebody else, right? Of course not. He's the God of second chances and third chances and thousand chances. If you keep your heart open to him, it doesn't matter how many times you've messed up. He'll use you. He'll use you. Bob Goff, I like the, what he said. He said, God doesn't love us more when we succeed or less when we fail. He delights in our attempts. God doesn't love us more when we succeed or less when we fail. He delights in our attempts. Moses needed a lot of coaxing just to get going. But then look what he did for the Lord. This was uh, an awesome story. It was about um, a, a man and a woman who felt the call of God on, our, on their lives, but in some way they did the same thing. They went before they were sent. Uh, the name Vanita um, Schlaf, we'll just call her Vanita S. because I can't pronounce her last name. But she's confined to a wheelchair, paralyzed from the shoulders down. She's also the wife of a godly man named Larry. They once served as missionaries in Venezuela. They began their marriage with a strong determination, desiring to do God's will, but in their own way, at their own time. They just, it was with good motives. We just want to go serve the Lord, but they didn't wait for God to show them where and when and what. They just went barreling on to do it. Then early in their marriage, they're traveling in a car with some relatives, but they never arrived at their destination. Their car ran head-on into another, and Vanita was thrown from the back seat, and her spinal cord was severed at the neck. From that moment on, she was completely paralyzed. Through a series of operations and doctors, they finally told Larry the hard truth, you're going to have to live with the fact your wife will be in a wheelchair for the rest of her life, and you won't be able to have a family. Frankly, you're going to have to care for her as if she was a child. Larry remembered his wedding vows and determined to keep them regardless and stay by her side. When they travel together, he lifts her into the car, folding up a wheel, her wheelchair in the trunk. At night, he dresses her for bed and feeds her. In the morning, he lifts her from bed, places her in the chair, and feeds her breakfast. Together, for several years, they were engaged in a bookstore min ministry in Venezuela, faithfully sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ at every opportunity. They worked through the shock and the grief and the bitterness, and they came out trusting God on the other side. 
They quit leaning on their own understanding. They remain to this day highly effective tools for Jesus Christ. In my mind, this man and woman are living the most attractive, winsome examples of burning bushes I've ever met. And that's Chuck Swindoll saying that. Contrary to what the doctors told them, Vanita has, born, has um, given birth to three healthy children. Remember the midwives? Right in chapter 1 of Exodus, remember the midwives when Pharaoh said, every baby boy you throw in the Nile to drown or be eaten by the crocodiles, and they refused to do it? They feared the Lord more than they feared man, and what did the Lord bless them with? A family. That's what happened to these two when they finally got on God's page, in God's time, in God's will, in God's way. And you know really what happens when you come to the fact of, or the declaration of, Lord, it doesn't matter if you don't even give me this. I'm going to love you anyway. Amazing things happen. Larry came to the Lord one day, as did Vanita, and said, we may not be much, but we're available, thorns and all. We're just a couple of ordinary bushes, Lord. Please set us on fire for your glory. We can all do that. I gave you a a checklist um, today. Just, you know, get your ears turned to God's frequency. Get your eyes off of your circumstances and fix them on your Savior. We're just going to be going through these. But number one, number one, I didn't put it on there because we talked about it so much last week, but you've got to make this your conditioned response. Remember last week? I know I'm not, but I know I am. I know I'm not. I know I'm not able to save myself, but I know I am. I know Yahweh. I know God. I know I'm not worthy but I know I am. He told us that his name, I am, it makes up for everything we're not. So you can put that whole laundry list in there, whatever it is, whatever all your weaknesses, whatever all your failures are, I know I'm not, but I know I am. And that's that's what's going to take you to glory in heaven. It's who you know and the fact that you're with him. I know I'm not. I know I'm not as loving as I should be, but I know I am. He'll help me. I know I'm not as forgiving as I should be, but I know I'm not, and I know he'll help me. That needs to become a conditioned response. When your flesh acts up, when Satan is in your ear, really? Really? You think you're a follower of Christ? Look at what you just messed up again. You go right back like a dog to its vomit. I know I'm not all that, but I know I am. It's your weapon against Satan. It strengthens you because you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. So your conditioned response, I know I'm not, but I know I am. If a dog can learn to salivate when a bell rings, you can learn, you can be conditioned to, I know I'm not, but I know I am. He's the one. I'm with him. So that needs to be first and foremost our response. There was that silly little story about the elephant and the mouse walking across a suspension bridge. And that thing's swinging by the, other, the time they get to the other side. And the little mouse looks at the elephant and said, boy, we really made that bridge move, didn't we? Okay? You're with him. It's God making things move. You're along for the ride. You get to the other side, and you get the blessing. You're with him. You may not be this, that, and the other, but he is. We need to get rid of our what ifs. <laughs> Moses, you know, he, he, he goes, and, and we're going to talk about getting rid of our big butts too. He gets, he gets called from the bush. God tells him all of the things that is, are going to happen. And, and starting in verse 7 of Exodus 3, I've seen the affliction of the people. I've heard their cry. I know their suffering. I have come down to deliver them. God, when God speaks, it happens because he knows the end from the beginning. God doesn't make mistakes because he knows in his sovereignty and his all-knowingness, if you can call it that, he knows what's going to happen. And he tells him, I've come down to deliver him, to bring him out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and sugar. I'm sorry, that was the haagen thing. A land flowing with milk and honey, okay? To the, to the land of, and he lists all the ites in there, I've seen the oppression. Come now, I'll send you. And what, what happens after that? Moses, come now, I'm going to send you. Here comes the flood of butts. It was all sounding really good. Oh, good. 
God's going to get them released from slavery, released from bondage. This is wonderful. Now, Moses, I'm going to use you. And Moses starts looking around. Really? Selective hearing. I liked what you said about the deliverance and all that, but me? And he comes back with, who am I? And remember, we said, that's, that's not humility there. That's like, no, the focus is on him. It's about him still. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? And then we talked about God didn't give him this great big pep talk when he said, who am I? Oh, Moses, you're awesome and you're wonderful and you can do it. God said, I'll be with you. That's all he needed. It doesn't matter who we are. The great I am is with us. But we see Moses start with all the excuses, all the buts, right? But I will be with you. And then, well, who should I say you are? And that's when the I am that I am. And we talked about in Hebrew, that's Yahweh. That's God's name. His, his, the, the Jews won't even say. Remember, they take out the vowels. It was really cute. This lady got all excited after a Bible study, and she, she learned all this about Yahweh and all the different names of God. And, and her little boy stumbles right into it a couple weeks later. He goes, Mom, why does God have more than one name? So she just starts, well, it was Yahweh, and it was Adonai, and then it's El Shaddai, and it's this. And the little boy just looks at her and says, can I just call him Steve? Okay? (laughs) But the thing is, even if that's what you call him, my Lord, I I just love you. Can I call you Steve? God just wants relationship with you. And yes, his beautiful names that mean so many different things. El Shaddai, did you know Shad is the word for breast in Hebrew? El Shaddai, the word for breast. So God gave us that name for, I'm holding you close. I got you right against my chest. You can feel my heartbeat against yours. He gave himself all these names so we could understand him more deeply. But when we come to him, just like a child, if all we can understand at the moment is Steve, he'll answer to that too. Okay? God has got us covered. God has got us covered. Who I am who I am. The third excuse is in chapter 4. Well, what if they won't believe me? That's the actual, the, the better translation, yours may say like mine, but behold, they will not believe me. Really, he says, what if? What if they will not believe me? And, and the thing is, Moses was being a man here, okay? We're in, in Exodus 4.1, but behold, what if they don't believe me or listen to my voice? Right up. In 3.18, just go up a few verses, God says, and they'll listen to your voice. God's already told him. God's already reassured him. They will listen to you. And then here he is being a man. Well, what if they don't? What if they don't listen? Well, I, I told you they would. What if are the words for warriors? And that needs to stop. We talked last week about how much more time would we have if we quit trying to control things and manipulate things. Some people would free up hours in their day if they quit trying to play God and and just get their little fingers in everything. How much time would you free up if you quit worrying? What if our words for warriors? Okay, what if? They they, they did this study, and, and I was a psychology major, so I actually like to understand how they did the studies. But they did a study, and you've probably heard it too, 90% of the things we worry about never happen. And you're going, how can you objectively study that? Say I'm in my 20s, and I worry I'm going to get cancer someday. And I do, but not till I'm 70. Did you study me for 50 years to see whether it happened or not? So to say 90% of the things we worry about never happen, You know, I don't see how they can objectively quantify that, but I know this. We worry about so many things, it's a huge pile. So it could be 90% of them never happen just because of the sheer number of things we worry about. But we have this sovereign God. That's why we're doing this study. We're watching God's sovereign hand run right under the Israelites and take them out of bondage and take care of them and love them and bring them to the promised land. We watch his hand just taking care of all these things, just like the example we started with, the guy out of prison who's found by the director, okay? God's hand is under everything all the time. Alistair Begg said this, and I I really loved it. He said, God's sovereignty is the soft pillow you can lay your head on at night. You don't have to take those worries to bed with you. God's sovereignty is is the soft pillow you lay your head on at night. Your times are in his hands. That's uh, Psalm 31, 15. Your times are in his hands. He's ordained all your days. 
So when you lay your head down at night, you can truly say, God's got it. I'm worried about my kid, I'm worried about my friend, worried about my spouse, worried about the bills, worried about diseases, worried about this, that, or the other. God is in control, and his sovereign hand is running under it all. So he tells you, have a good sleep. I'm right here with you. I'm still awake. The God of Israel doesn't sleep or slumber. He's watching over you. So his sovereignty means you can put your head down and have a good sleep. He's got you covered. And so many people will say that, you know, they'll go on and on and on and on and on about their problems, and then they'll go, well, God's got it. Can't we reverse that? Can't we say start with, can't we lead with, God's got it. I'm struggling with this. We need to share our struggles with each other. I'm struggling with this, but let's start with God's got it because God does have it. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He was in charge in the times of Exodus. He's in, the char- in charge of what's going on now. And look, at I showed you, I can show you other places too. God already told Moses what was going to happen. They're going to listen to you. They're going to listen to you. And then he comes back with his what if, well, what if they don't listen? I told you they would. I don't know what's going to happen. Look at our world. Things are happening that we've never seen before. This is happening and that's happening. What, what, shouldn't we be worried about that? Guess what? Newsflash, God has told us what's going to happen. Open up Matthew 24. Jesus' words, he tells us what's going to happen. Read the book of Revelation. We did that study last year. You can watch that online on the church website. We did the whole book of Revelation. God tells us what's going to happen. Just like he told Moses what's going to happen, he tells us. Matthew 24, the cliff notes, and then the book of Revelation, the whole thing. He tells us. Well, that's some scary stuff. Revelation, that's, that's some scary stuff. Yeah, and who are you with? You're with him. Okay, you're with him. He's walking you through it. What are you worried about? In all honesty, get rid of the what ifs. They're the words of worriers. Philippians 4, 6 and 7, don't be worried about anything. How's that for an emphatic statement? Don't be worried about anything, but in everything, with prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That peace that skips your head and goes right to your heart. It transcends all. I, I should be worried. I got all this going on, but I'm not. Why? Because the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind. Don't skip over God's reassurances to you. The Bible's full of them. I'll always love you. I've loved you with an everlasting love. That's Jeremiah 31, 3. So you're not, well, what if God stops loving me? He's loved you with an everlasting love. They have so much trouble translating that word for love. It's hesed in the Hebrew. They, they've tried all these different, what does it, okay, he's loved us with an everlasting love. They said he loves us with an endless love. He loves us with a steadfast love, this loyal, enduring love. I don't care how they translate it. Aren't all those really good? You want to be loved endlessly, everlastingly, loyally? They're all good. That's how he loves you. He reassures you right there. I will not stop loving you. No matter what you do, it's it's right there. There's your reassurance. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You don't have to worry about your salvation now. You're reassured right there. Yeah, but what if somebody snatches me from his hand? John 10, nothing will snatch you from my hand. Reassurance, after reassurance he gave him to Moses, he gives them to you. But Moses was so worried about what would happen, he didn't listen to what God said would happen. Moses was so worried about what might happen that he didn't listen to God tell him what would happen. I might have messed it up the first time I said it. Let's do it one more time. Moses was so worried about what might happen that he didn't listen to God tell him what would happen. Okay, don't fall into that. God was saying, I will do this, and I will do this, and I will do this. That's what we need to be listening to, not our what-ifs, okay? I want to break this down, too. I, I, I've even taught a whole retreat on Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 and never saw this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. 
and lean not on your own what? Understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. And then 3.7, don't be wise in your own eyes. Think about that for a minute. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. That's the part that I missed. Leaning on your own understanding, you're making your own crutches. Think about that. When you are leaning on your own understanding, you're making your own crutches. Man-made, woman-made crutches. Yeah, instead of trusting him, I'm what-ifing, and I'm trying to manipulate and control and change. You're never going to understand when you're in the midst. You're never going to understand what's going on when you're in the midst. I can give you biblical examples, many of them. I'm just going to give you a couple. Think about Joseph. Joseph in the midst. Here he is, you know, got this daddy that favors him and gives him this great coat. So now, therefore, he has brothers who hate him, okay, because he's daddy's favorite, right? Right? Jacob was never asked to teach parenting classes. So he, he singles out Joseph, so now his brothers hate him. So his brothers throw him down a well. And then he has, ends up in prison, unfairly accused. Do you think he sat in the bottom of that well before he was sold into slavery? Do you think he sat in prison before the next thing and he went, you know, I'm here because someday I'm going to be second in charge of all of Egypt. I'm going to save Egypt from famine. I'm going to save my family who becomes a nation from starvation. I'm going to be able to bring my family to Egypt and take care of them. You will not be able to figure out things in the midst. Moses, the call from the bush. He had no way to figure out everything that was going to happen, but God's sovereign hand was under it. David, out in the fields, the youngest son out there taking care of the sheep. Shepherds were in a really high position then, but he was out getting to know God. He may not have known him as Yahweh or anything else. He may have been calling him Steve, but he was getting to know God where he was. The heavens declare the glory of God. He met him as creator. And then he saw God as protector as the lions and the bears came at him and he's using a slingshot to protect himself. Do you think in the midst of all that, David said, well, you know, I'm uh, working with a slingshot because someday I'm going to kill Goliath and then I'm going to go be the king of Israel. Things don't make sense in the midst. So quit spending your time trying to figure them out. Look how much time you're going to save to let God be large and in charge, be sovereign, know he has a plan, and just trust him. Get rid of your man-made crutches. You're not going to understand in the midst because we are 5,000 star people. I've said it before, 5,000 star people. If we go outside on a very clear night here, and we're pretty good here. We don't have as much light interference as like LA and stuff. But if you go outside, you're going to see 5,000 stars. That's what astronomers say the most you're going to see. There's billions up there. Billions. God placed every one. But you're only going to see 5,000. So how big is your picture? How big is your picture? Quit leaning on your own understanding. You've got a postage stamp picture. You're not going to understand in the midst. I got an example of it yesterday. We've got this little lab puppy at our house. He's seven months old, and his name is Chuck. Um, and he, I named him after, you know, Charlie Brown, Peppermint Patty thing, call him Chuck. I should have called him Tigger, because all he does is bounce and jump and all those things. We've never had a lab before. But I went away for the weekend and, and came back, and Chump, Chuck is limping so bad and can't even put weight on one leg. So, of course, I blame my husband, because he was watching him. What, what did you do to Chuck? He said, I didn't do anything. He starts limping, so we take him to the doctor. And the, the doctor comes in, he looks at him, and he looks at me, he goes, does he jump much? And I looked at him, and I promised what I wanted to say was, didn't he just jump on you when you walked in the exam room? And any of you that have been to our house since we've had Chuck, you know Chuck jumps 100% of the time. We have not been able to get the happy out of the boy. He's just jumping everywhere. So the, the fix is Chuck has to go on all this medicine because he's messed up a growth plate in his leg, which could affect his whole little life. So he's on all this medicine, and we have to keep him quiet for two weeks. <laughs> And, the, and I'm looking, he must have seen, the vet must have seen the disbelief in my face because we have another dog who we got Chuck for because the dog needed somebody to run around with. Griff, and um, so he must, he, he gave me sedatives for Chuck. Okay, so, so look at little Chuck. Favorite things, taking walks. Favorite thing, 
racing in the backyard after Griff. Favorite thing, jumping on people. Okay, favorite thing, eating, because he's a lab and that's all they want to do. Chuck has got to be in puppy prison for the next two weeks. What's his little brain thinking? I, I put him in this morning when I exercised. I put him in when I left here. He's in puppy prison. What do you think he's thinking? What, did I do something wrong? Are you punishing me? Do you not love me anymore? Do you not care? I, I've lost everything important to me. Do, are you not paying attention? Have you ever said those things to God? Look at Chuck's picture. Look at Chuck's little tiny puppy picture when really we as adults and, and people can say, Chuck, two weeks, dude. You got to be down two weeks, but then you'll get your whole life to run and jump on people and do all the things you like to do. But he's just got this tiny, tiny little picture, if any picture, because he's a dog. But, but tiny, that's us. That's us and God. We have this tiny little, God, you got to fix this now. God's got the big picture. It applies to people, too. There's this dear friend of mine, and she's marrying this guy, and, and he's just not good, okay? So she, she introduces me to him, and within five minutes, I'm like, no, no. And so after they leave, I started praying him out, okay? I start praying him out. It worked with my sons. Okay, I had three sons, and with all the little girlfriends over the years, you pray him in, you pray him out, you know? And, and my praying out worked. And these, my three boys have found good, godly Christian women. They're awesome. Okay, so, so I, in the process of praying this guy out, okay, and, and, and he doesn't like me either, let's be fair. But... <laughs> As I'm praying, I'm like, God, she's a good lady. And, and look at him. And I start listing all the stuff wrong with him because, you know, God may not know. And <laughs> so I'm, I'm praying this guy out. And then here comes the save the date for the wedding. And I'm like, it's still on. I got to pray harder. Right? And, and so doing this. And then God just spoke to me as I'm looking at this sovereignty. And lean not on your own understanding. Look at what I'm leaning on, my arrogance, that I think I know what's best for her. Do you think maybe by God's sovereign plan, he allowed those two to meet because someday they're going to get saved together? Maybe this guy is going to help lead her to salvation. Look at God's sovereign hand versus my stupid, leaning on my own understanding, my crutch of arrogance. We need to get rid of our self-made crutches and just trust God. So now I just pray God's will, because you know, what I should have been praying all along, but I had to go through the stupidity first of being critical and judgmental. But you know what? Sin is stupid, isn't it? Let go of your self-made crutches. <laughs> Don't limit God with your prayers. Don't limit God. Don't limit God. I, I love this story in the New Testament. It's in the Gospel of Matthew. Just, just read it later. It's uh, Matthew chapter 20, starting in verse 29. As Jesus and the disciples go out of Jericho, a great crowd follows. And behold, there were two blind men sitting by the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. The crowd rebuked them, telling them to be silent, but they cried out all the more. Lord, have mercy on us son of David, and stopping, Jesus called them and said, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Lord, let our eyes be opened. And Jesus in pity touched their eyes, it's a compassion is another word that was used, and Jesus in compassion touched their eyes, and immediately they recovered their sight and followed him. Don't limit God with your prayers to protect him. What do you want me to do for you? He was establishing relationship, he knew, they were blind. They wanted to see, but don't limit what God could do to protect him. They didn't say, Jesus, would you make, him, make us canes? They asked for healing. They didn't limit him. They saw him for who he was, the all-powerful Savior, the all-powerful healer. Don't try to protect God with your prayers. Well, you know, if we ask him to make us canes, if he doesn't do that, we can make our own, right? Right? Don't, don't, don't try to protect God with your prayers. Ask, ask big. You have a big God. They asked big, and they were healed. 
people with hurting hearts right now that are just going through terrible, terrible things. I'm hurting so bad, I don't even know how to verbalize it. Ask for healing. You have a big God. Don't limit him. Don't protect him with your prayers. Quit leaning on your own understanding. God, my kids wandered off, and they're in such a pit right now. He or she will never come back. You have a big God who gave them a mom that will keep praying. Don't limit God with your prayers. Don't try to protect him with your prayers. Don't lean on your own understanding. You ask. Boy, there's certain people I hope never watch this tape, though, after I said all that about the friend and the guy. Okay. Um, <laughs> I know, I know. It's woo, 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 woo. All right. It was just such a good example. Off we went. <laughs> all right. It was good, right? I mean, okay. Okay. God is all powerful and in control. We know that. We just have to remind ourselves sometimes. It's not about you. Get off your island. It's not about you. Get off your island. Look at Moses, all of his excuses. We just talked about, you know, what if they don't believe me? Who's that about? God's given you the words. What if they don't believe me? It's not about you, okay? Who am I? It's not about you. In, in, in Exodus 4, verse 10, but I'm not eloquent. It's not about you. In verse 13, chapter 4, oh, my Lord, please someone, send someone else. He's saying, I don't want to. It's not about you. We need to get off our island and be God-focused. And, and we can say it easily, but it's not about us. We need to live it. It's not about us. It's what God is doing through you. I'm with him. Okay, it's never about us. <laughs> Brian Atwood, the way he said it, he said, Moses had mood swings from self-sufficient pride to self-debasing fear. Neither was usable by God. Mood swings between self-sufficient pride and self-debasing fear. Neither was usable by God. Get off of the island. It's not about us. Get rid of your big butt. Moses had but, 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 but. Not eloquent. What if they don't believe me? I don't want to do it. But, 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 but. Get off your big butt. How do we do that? Well, if you've got a physically big butt, what do you do? Diet and exercise, right? Right? Diet. You do the same thing to get off your big excuse butt. Diet. Your diet is the word of God. He said to us in Psalm 34, 8, taste and see that the Lord is good. He's inviting you into it, okay? Diet, you need the word of God as much as you need your daily food. You need the living water as much as you need actual water to survive on. Let that be your diet. Diet, feast on God's word. So to get rid of the big butts, diet on the word of God, and exercise, you exercise your faith. Exercise your faith. Faith comes through hearing, and hearing through the word of God. Romans 10, 17, it all goes back to the same thing. I don't honestly know how you get through life without reading this. This has everything we need to live a victorious life, a godly life. So exercise faith. Faith is taking the first step even when you can't see the whole staircase. Faith is taking the first step, even when you can't see the whole staircase. Martin Luther King said that. He stepped on on faith and did some stuff, didn't he? Count your steps, right? That's a big thing, right? For exercise, how many steps did I walk today? The people that'll stand there by bedside getting more steps, walking in place because they didn't get all their steps during the day. How do you step? You step in obedience, you step in obedience to God because you know what? The victorious Christian life is not a parade down Main Street. The victorious Christian life is not a parade down Main Street. It's step by step by step in obedience. So you take your steps. Feast on the word of God. You exercise your faith. You step in obedience. This uh, a guy named Nelson Mink said this. He said, Lord, I'm willing I'm willing to receive what you give. I'm willing to lack what you withhold. 
I'm willing to relinquish what you take. I'm willing to suffer what you require. It's exactly what we're talking. He dropped his man-made crutches when he said that. I'm willing to receive what you give. We like that part, right? Don't, 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 if I start going around and asking everybody's favorite verses, in all things God works for the good, for God so loved the world, you'd be giving me great verses, wouldn't you? Your favorite verses, I don't know if any one of you would say your favorite verse is, in this life, you will have trouble. Is that anybody's favorite verse? Okay. But he starts off, I'm willing to give what you receive. I'm willing to lack what you withhold. He's opening himself up to, in this life, you will have trouble. I'm willing to relinquish what you take, and I'm willing to suffer what you require. Lord, I'm willing. That's step in obedience. We need to have a correct understanding of sovereignty, God's sovereignty. Okay, I want you to think about it. We talked about it's the soft pillow that you lay your head on at night. Your times are in his hands. He's ordained all your days. He's, he's in control. He's large and in charge, the name of our study. But you've got to have a correct understanding of it. We don't sit on the couch and just say, okay, you're sovereign. I can be a blob here. Okay, we just talked about diet and exercise as far as getting rid of our butts. But God's sovereignty, absolutely. And God also gave you a Bible, a brain, and the Holy Spirit. It's not about sitting on the couch. Okay, just look at our example with Moses' mom. They hid him for three months because they saw he was a fine, beautiful child. And as we mentioned, that's what he wrote about himself. He was a fine, beautiful child. He hadn't gone to Humility 101 in the backside of the desert yet. But fine, beautiful child, so his, his parents hide him. But then when he's too big to keep hidden, because as you get older, you get noisier, you get more mobile, right? So the mom makes the little ark. We said same word as Moses' ark. And she put him in, had him put in the Nile in the reeds with his sister watching. Did she trust God's sovereignty? Absolutely. She released her baby. But did she use her brain? She didn't have a Bible yet. Didn't have the Holy Spirit yet, but she was relying on the Lord. The Holy Spirit as we know him, because it was Old Testament times, but relying on the Lord, I'll put the sister there to watch and see what happens. Okay? Trust God's sovereignty, but do what you can there. Think about Nehemiah. Nehemiah was getting all these threats. Okay, you can read about him in Nehemiah chapter 4. He's rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. He's doing what God's told him to do. So here comes Satan, going to mess this up. So he's got these guys making threats and doing all this stuff. You know what Nehemiah said in, in Nehemiah 4 verse 9? He prayed, and then he posted a guard. He prayed, God's sovereign, God's going to take care of it, and he posted a guard. Okay, so there's this balance, and sometimes we just have, God, what is, I, I totally trust your sovereignty, but what do you want me to do in this situation? I trust God's sovereignty. So this morning, I left the front door of my house open, I left the garage door open, I opened the door of the safe, and then I put um, any cash we had on the house in the front table. Um, I put a big arrow, Chuck is here if you want to steal him, right? So all this stuff, I trust God's sovereignty. And you guys are sitting here going, and you're a moron, right? <laughs> Bible, brain, Holy Spirit, right? Yes, God's sovereign. Yes, God's protecting and watching out for us. But don't be stupid. Don't go running down the middle of the street. God's going to protect me. Well, yeah, there's cars coming in both directions. Did he tell you to be running right there? Okay. Get a correct understanding of it. We do have a part in what we are supposed to do, right? We talked about God's giving his gracious and kind reassurances to Moses. You see another one. Remember when Moses, I, I had explained, after Moses killed the Egyptian, remember he looked side to side, but he didn't look up. He took matters in his own hands. He kills the Egyptian. Israelites tell him the next day, we saw what you did. He runs away. The Pharaoh said, kill him. Pharaoh put a, put a bounty on Moses' head. He said, kill him. Now look what God's doing. God's calling Moses to go to said Pharaoh back in Egypt saying, let my people go, right? The Pharaohs put a bounty on Moses' head. Now God's telling Moses to go back. He didn't have to do this, but in chapter 4, verse 19, the Lord said to Moses, go back to Egypt 
for all the men who are seeking your life are dead. God gave Moses reassurance, just kind reassurance that he didn't have to do. He could have said, just, just go back in faith. But he told them. He told them, the men that are seeking your life are dead. Well, I wish God would give me reassurances like that. Well, Hebrews 13, 5 and 6, right? I'll be with you. <laughs> I'll never leave nor forsake you. Matthew 28, 20. I'll be with you always, even to the end of the age. We talked about, I'll love you with an everlasting love. How about those assurances? He's speaking the same ones to you. Second Chronicles 16, 9. For the eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. That Second Chronicles 16, 9. Look at all the assurances, but you're not going to get them unless you're feasting on God's word. So God did this gracious thing for Moses. It's okay to go back. The guys that are seeking you aren't there anymore. He reassures us too. And there is, uh, it talks about it, it, we're going to be talking about it throughout the study. In verse 21 of chapter 4, And the Lord said to Moses, When you go back to Egypt, See that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles I put in your heart. We talked about that. God gave him three signs. But I will harden his heart so he will not let the people go. Okay, that's uh, Exodus 4.21. I want to touch on it now, but honest, we're just going to keep going over. God hardened his heart. How fair was that? He hardened his heart, and then he wouldn't obey God. How fair is that? Hardening means to bring to the surface what's already there. Okay, that's, that's the concept, the, the word bringing to the surface that which is already there. Another way they look at it in the Hebrew is to strengthen or fortify. So God brought to the surface what was in Pharaoh's heart. And, and we're going to see as we go through, we'll point them out, and you read them on your own as you go, but you're going to see God hardened Pharaoh's heart, Pharaoh hardened his own heart. It, that's what it's going to look like. But, but yeah, I agree, it, it, it wouldn't be fair right? But it's bringing to the surface what's already there, basically exposing what was in Pharaoh's heart. And when we hit the beginning of chapter 5, you're going to see it just like that, okay? So it's not like, oh, God did a mean thing. Absolutely not. God brought to the surface what was there. So I just wanted to talk about that now so you can start looking for it. It's, if you want a New Testament example, read Romans 1, starting about 18 to 32, when God just gave them over to their own sin, they're doing all this stuff, and God gives them over to it. It's, it's the same kind of picture, the same kind of idea. It's out, it's bringing out what's already there, and God gives them over to it. So that's a kind of a New Testament parallel there. Not perfect, but that, that is what it looks like. And one more thing I just want to put, because, just touch, this, touch on it real quick, because this is another one. People look at it and say, what's going on here? Verse 24, at the lodging place on the way the Lord met him, Moses, and sought to put him to death. So here he is going off to do what God wants him to do. And God's going to put him to death. The, the scholars say that the connotation of it is like he got really sick. Okay, God's going to put him to death. And then Zipporah, his wife, takes a flint and cuts off her son's foreskin and touched Moses' feet with it and said, surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. So God let him alone. And it was then she said a bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. So What's that all about? Moses is going off to do what God's told him to do, and now God stopped him in his tracks in some way, if they're right, they make sick or whatever, but God's going to kill Moses when he's on his way? Moses had disobedience in his life, okay? Moses had disobedience in his life. The covenant sign between God and the Israelites, his chosen people, was circumcision, Moses hadn't circumcised his own son. So Moses is marching off in obedience to do what God told him to do, and he's got sin in his life. So God literally stops him in his tracks. Mrs. Moses does this on-the-spot circumcision. Really, our pity should be with the kid, just saying. Uh, they didn't have sharp scalpels and stuff then. Flint's a rock. Okay, she took care of the problem. I mean, if this was a room full of men, can you imagine the flinching? Okay. All right, but she takes and then she throws it at his feet. Throws it at his feet. There was sin in the private parts. Okay, do we have sin in the private parts of our lives? 
okay? Here we are. Yes, okay, I see that God's calling to me. Yes, this is this, this, and this. I'm so excited. I want to embark on this new journey with the Lord, and I want every day is going to be new, and his mercies are going to be new, and off I go. But if you've got sin in your private parts, you're not going to be effective. And, and, and that can look like anything now. It can look at stuff. It can be stuff we're looking at on the computer because, you know, that is just, that's, that's from the pit of hell when it's, nobody's going to know. It's just pictures. Once they go in your head, sister, they're stuck. You know, it's going to take God to get them out in a mighty act. So, so if you, you've got sin, if it's stuff you're looking at, if it's stuff you're reading, if it's thoughts that just you play with, you play with it. <laughs> Say somebody's really hurt you. And so in those moments you go and you just think about how much you hate them. How much you hate them. And you just, you know, just for those few minutes, I'm just going, you know, I hope really bad things happen to them. I just hate, and, and you're just waiting in the sewage of hatred and bitterness. And, you, and you're just doing that. That's sin in the private parts. And if you're going to be effective from the Lord, that, for the Lord, that's got to go. Remember, you know, Jesus, again, I, I just love it. God is the same, yes, or Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God said, I, the Lord, do not change. It's in New Testament and Old Testament. The same parallels. We see this throwing off of the, the, the for, you know, just throwing that away, taking the foreskin and throwing it down. What did Jesus say? If your arm's causing you to sin, what do you do? Cut it off. If your eye's causing you to sin, what do you do? And that was a hyperbole for this is how to deal forcefully with sin, but it's the same thing. If you've got sin in your private parts, you're not going to be able to lead the life God wants you to lead. And the, the wonderful thing about our God is he'll show you, and then he'll forgive you. Okay, it's, it's not all about just a conviction. I go before God and I say, Lord, if there's sin in my life, please show me. And I've said that prayer a lot. And the graciousness of God, he, he shows you one thing at a time, doesn't he? Because if, if, if I say, God, please show me the sin in my life, and here comes the dump truck, and it dumps it all there. But he, graciously, he shows you one or two things at a time, and then you go, you confess your sin. You agree with him that it's sin, and because he's faithful and just, he forgives. So if there's something going on, please get rid of it. In God's grace and warning, extended to the Pharaoh even too, this guy who's an agent of Satan, we'll see him next week, Pharaoh, just, just demonically, satanically controlled. Do you know God showed grace to him too? In, in Exodus 4, verse 23, God tells Moses to warn Pharaoh that he's going to lose his firstborn if he disobeys. God, if you refuse to let them go, I will kill your firstborn son. So right here, if you want to read it, start reading in Exodus 4, verse 21, down to verse 23 later, God gives a summary of what's going to happen in the plagues. I'm going to do this. You are going to let my people go, and you are going to do this. And if you don't do it, I'm taking your firstborn. In his grace, God warned even Pharaoh. Is that a gracious God or what? He even gave Pharaoh a chance. That's why I'm saying people, well, he hardened it, that's not fair. No, God even gave Pharaoh a chance. Remember in, in, in Revelation, over and over and over, chance after chance after chance to repent. The two witnesses spreading the gospel. The angel in heaven spreading the gospel. The 144,000 evangelists on steroids spreading the gospel. God gave chances time after time. He gave Pharaoh a chance. If you don't let him go, I'm taking your kid. I'm taking your, even him. God showed grace to because God can't help it. He's a gracious, loving God. So even there, the Bible is full of clear warnings, even to people like Pharaoh. So we talked about getting every part right. And it ends in verse 31, and the people believed. And when they heard the Lord had visited the people of Israel and that he had seen their affliction, they bowed their heads and worshiped. They bowed their heads and worshiped. And I'm going to ask you to hang on to that verse because once you flip into chapter 5, you're going, where did these people go? The people that were bowing their heads in worship and believing what God says. Because I know it never happens to us. Once we commit to, yes, Lord, I believe you, we never have a doubt again, right? And we never say, God, where are you again? Or, or any of those things. 
but right here they're worshiping. And then you flip a page or go to the next thing and, and suddenly they're doubting and they're upset and they're, where are you? And you said, but, because they're leaning on their own what? Understanding. So I'm so thankful this is where we're ending for the week on the worship part. And I just encourage everybody to do a lot of that because it's the very best thing that we can do. When I think about living a life worthy of the Lord, a life that literally weighs as much as him in value, I know it's absolutely impossible in and of myself. It would be like putting a styrofoam cup on a scale next to a pile of gold. My life is worth nothing compared to him. But when I put my trust in Christ, God filled me with himself. He filled this styrofoam cup with his holy presence. Then my life gained value and weight. All of a sudden, I was qualified not only to be productive in this life, but to share the glories of the next life with all the saints. That's what we've been talking about today. I'm with him. And he's sovereign, and he's in control. And we don't have to lean on our own tiny picture understanding. He's got it. So tonight, lay your head down on your soft pillow of his sovereignty. Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you so very much for being in control. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for assuring us of your love and your presence. Thank you for sending your son to die for us. And Jesus, I just pray that each of us takes one thing out of here and comes to know you better. Lord, I ask that you please bless and protect every lady, her mind and her heart and her body, her family and her friends, her travel, her study time. And I pray that each one of us just dives into a deeper, loving relationship with you, Lord. Thank you for the way you love us, and thank you for the way you take care of us. In your precious name, amen.